Hi, today's lecture is going to be about international trade. Before we get into the theories of international trade, let me briefly review what the take-home assignment will be about so that you know what to pay attention to and make sure that you're preparing as you're listening to the, uh, listening to the lecture. Uh, most of the theories of international trade are based on the idea that each country should focus on making and selling products that it does better than the rest of the world. Now today it may appear that just about anything can be done cheaper and equally well by China. And so many people fear that the United States may soon lose in the international trade wars to China just because China is developing new technologies, uh, mimicking the old ones, and at the same time labor is so cheap. And so people fear that there will be really nothing left that the United States can do better than China. We understand that this is not true. I mean, America is still a uh, one of the major manufacturers of goods, the major uh, producer or the major supplier of services. And then uh, there are many things that America can do better than anybody else on this planet. Um, so the take-home assignment will be basically about finding things that America can do best or better than others, or uh, at least uh, things that America may be making and somebody else would be interested in buying from the United States. And so your take-home assignment would be basically identify those industries and products, but not just, you know, think of uh, something and write down the names of the products. You would actually have to do some analysis here <clears throat> and um, uh, explain why you think America holds competitive uh, or comparative advantage in a particular area. Uh, so when we will be talking about uh, theories of international trade, pay close attention to how uh, you analyze where a particular country may hold an absolute advantage or comparative advantage, or as we call them in general, competitive advantage in international trade. I will be making more references to the take-home assignment uh, throughout the lecture, but the main idea is now clear, so let's move on back to the lecture. First, before we get into the um, theories of international trade, let's review some statistics. So, who trades with whom? Who are the world's top traders? Uh, it's difficult to uh, talk about international trade as a total volume of trade, just because countries are so different in size. Little Singapore uh, trades a lot, and even though the overall volume is not huge, it is huge compared to the country's GDP. At the same time, if you take the United States, uh, the overall volume may be huge, but it's really small compared to the country's GDP. So this map here shows you who trades more or less adjusted for the country's size. And as you can see, the United States is at the very bottom of the list. So compared to other countries, United, the United States trades much less as measured in terms of the percent of uh, the trade volume compared to the volume of the economy as a whole. So only about 25% or actually less than that uh, of the goods and services that enter and leave the United States, uh, they comprise only about uh, less than 25% of the national uh, product. Uh, in comparison, for example, that same Hong Kong or uh, Singapore, you can actually see that they are selling and buying more than the GDP of the entire country. So in other words, the value or the uh, price, the value of the goods that cross the country every year is uh, much greater than the value of the goods and services made in the country. But this is not surprising. You would see that countries that have access to the sea are the biggest traders, and so obviously they are known ports and hubs. And again, Singapore and Hong Kong are obviously among them and actually highlighted on this map. And so it is the case for uh, many European countries, particularly those uh, that are close to the uh, kind of crossroads, uh, East, West, Asia, and Europe. Um, now, talking about the United States, can anyone tell me why the United States is at the end of the list? Or why the United States is not trading as much as you would think it would, given its global uh, position and uh, importance in the world? The answer is that the United States trades as much as any other country, or people in the United States trade as much as people in any other country. And the goods and services do move a lot within the United States and between the United States and other countries. The problem is that the United States is so big that um, a um, 
for example, transaction between uh, a guy in New York and a guy in LA or a service or a product going from New York to LA would still be considered domestic. And if you look at this map, you would understand that it's actually traveling a greater distance than, for example, crossing the entire Europe. But in the United States, it would still be considered domestic. Whereas, for example, in Europe, if you live in a small country like Belgium, Netherlands, or Luxembourg, like little countries here on the map, you would see that, uh, you know, there's a few miles away from your home, and that's already international trade, because that's already not in Germany, but in Luxembourg, or in uh, Belgium, or in the Netherlands. So the products and services do move a lot in the United States. It's just trade between, for example, New York State and uh, California is still considered domestic, and uh, obviously is not counted um, uh, towards international trade. And so for that reason, the United States ends up at the bottom of the list in terms of trade as a percentage of the uh, uh, GDP. Now, important things are that world trade is roughly 80% merchandise. So most of the trade between countries occurs in the form of made products. Uh, all that stuff that you see from China, uh, from clothes to shoes to uh, electronics and all so on, that's the main type of merchandise. United States sells a lot uh, to other countries outside China, primarily things like um, industrial equipment, airplanes, uh, so kind of heavier, more high-tech stuff uh, that uh, is very capital intensive to make, so it requires lots of machinery to make those things. Um, and so most of the trade is in the things that you can kind of touch. Services account only for about 20%, and those would be primarily financial services, insurance, um, call centers, that kind of stuff, and it's still a very small portion of the trade overall. Now, who are the world's top exporters? Well, not surprisingly, those are the countries that you probably suspect are top exporters. Interestingly, Germany is number one at this time, closely followed by the United States, and then China, Japan, France, and so on and so on. Many people would think that these days China is number one exporter, but as you can see, it's still, um, well, not quite half of what the United States sells. It's a little bit more than that, but still fairly a uh, smaller exporter than the United States is. One of the big reasons for that is that, yes, China sells many units of products, uh, all those, as I said, from matchsticks to uh, cars. But uh, the United States sells stuff that is much more expensive. I mean, one Boeing airplane uh, is probably worth, what, a thousand cars? And probably 10 million smaller things like you know cups like for example this one probably made in China but you know how many of these you need to make in order to uh, sell for the same amount uh, as for example a um, bulldozer by caterpillar or a um, an airplane by um, by Boeing Germany obviously again is a high-tech country and so they primarily sell things like cars chemical products uh, other high-tech equipment and so again, obviously, that the value of those goods is very high, and so not surprising that Germany is number one. But again, China is catching up really fast, not only um, by the increase in the number of units sold, but also um, in terms of the increase in the value of the goods, as well as the increase in sophistication and uh, price of those goods. So China is definitely catching up, and soon enough probably will be where the United States is today. Japan, France, Netherlands, no surprises there. Canada, uh, mainly natural resources, I'm guessing, but also lots of other things. Now, when you look at the exports uh, of services, the United States is by far number one. The United States has a strong tradition of uh, exporting services as well as delivering services, uh, strong culture of caring for customers. So it would be anything from consulting to financial services to insurance to all kinds of other types of services that American companies supply worldwide. Wide. Even things like, for example, English as the second language courses. I mean, obviously, American English is now the standard, and so this is a multi-billion industry, and it is accounted in these $318 billion. Um, the other countries, again, obviously, some of the most developed countries in the world, but then again, China still far, far behind the United States, but also catching up uh, quickly. I'm surprised not to see India on the list with um, India's programmers and call centers. I'm sure it would be also soon one of the uh, top providers of services, but according to this map here, uh, or this chart here, it's still not quite there where the United States is. Um, these graphs are described better in the textbook, so I'm just going to say that um, the main trends are that high-income nations trade much more than low-income nations. So uh, the United States, Germany, Europe uh, in general,
trade much more than poor countries do, and this is probably not surprising. The interesting thing is that um, North, North America imports more from Asia as it exports to Asia. And again, it's not, it's not to say that the imports are twice as big as exports. There is some trade deficit, but not quite as huge. But the United States tends to export most, most of its stuff to Europe, whereas it buys more and more things from Asia. So there is a definitely growing gap here. Now, who trades with whom? Uh, putting or making this uh, complicated map uh, simple. Uh, I would say that rich countries trade with rich countries. Poor countries tend to trade with poor countries. So Latin American countries trade primarily among themselves, not only because they are also poor, but mainly because of the geograph geographic proximity. The same applies to Africa. The same applies to developed European countries versus developing or Eastern European countries, and so on. So the United States trades more with Canada. And this is uh, America's main um, trading partner but then also Europe and Japan, and only then with uh, the other uh, less developed countries and regions. Now, in your optional regions, there is an excellent, very interesting article that I strongly recommend you to read. The article looks at, um, tries to predict who trades with whom, and it looks at a number of indicators or predictors that may explain why trade uh, is occurring between countries. And so the factors that they explore include things like, for example, income level. As the country becomes richer, obviously uh, the country will trade more. So there is just more to trade. And so uh, the article looks at, for example, how much uh, income, I mean, how much increase in trade will occur in response to 1% increase in income. And then physical distance, like kilometers or miles. So the longer the distance, the less or the more trade will be. Physical, this, uh, physical size of the country, access to the ocean, common border, common language common regional trading blocks, like, for example, members of NAFTA, colony, colonizer history, common colonizer, common currency, all those kinds of things. Now, what I'm interested in is in whether or not you can predict which of these factors are the best predictors of trade. So if you have two countries, uh, what would predict best or most uh, trade between the nations? I'm going to reveal the answers in a second, but look at these numbers, look at these uh, predictors, and see if you can... Um, guess which ones are more important factors that speed up trade between nations. Well, here are the answers. And uh, the biggest uh, predictor is colony colonizer history. So the United Kingdom trades much more with its former colonies. And uh, uh, the same thing is applies to uh, having a common, common colonizer. So the metropoly was building the relationships between its colonies or among its colonies and the um, um, metropoly or the center of the empire in such a way that all the roads were basically leading to the Rome, to Rome. And so even uh, though Rome does not exist anymore, well, the city obviously does, but the Roman Empire doesn't, much of the trade still occurs along those paths, along the infrastructure paths built by the empire. And so that's a big deal. Uh, now, it may seem like income level doesn't matter much, but it's not really true. I mean, here we're talking about 1% increase in income level. How much increase in trade does that translate into? And so uh, the translation, I mean, or the conversion is actually fairly impressive. Extra 1% in income leads to extra 0.7% in trade. So that's kind of a big deal. Uh, the distance, the greater the distance, uh, the uh, more trade, surprisingly. And then the greater the physical must have gotten those wrong. The greater physical distance, the greater the trade, uh, and then the uh, uh, greater the, hold on guys. Now this is embarrassing, and I probably should cut out that part from the video, but for now it will stay here. So the greater distance between the countries obviously lead to uh, a decreased, prob decreased probability that the two countries will trade. The increased physical distance, I mean size of the countries, increases probability just because of the, I suppose, uh, greater uh, length of the border. Access to the ocean, common border, all those things matter, and you can play with these numbers a little bit more. Now, two things that I would like to highlight here is that common currency matters a lot. Uh, for example, the euro, uh, the currency of the European Union, did increase trade dramatically, and uh, European nations now trade much more than they used uh, before euro. And uh, common regional trading blocks, I mean, NAFTA and all those uh, trading blocks of that type, 
uh, do stimulate trade a lot and do help our countries exchange goods and services big time. Now here is your question, uh, first bonus question, one of those that is likely to appear on the exam. And let's see if you know the answer to this one. Three, two, one, and the answer obviously is, it is C, the United States is number one exporter of services in the world. Now let's talk about specific theories. I mean, the whole uh, international economics field is pretty much about explaining who trades with whom as well as who should trade with whom. And so there have been a number of different uh, theories that explain uh, why people or countries trade and uh, what benefits or disadvantages certain factors may have uh, or may impact the decision making in terms of who should trade with whom. One interesting thing about this graph, and as you can see there are many theories here, is that a certain theories dominated the field for a long time, like for example mercantilism has been the theory for like three centuries, and then more and more theories of international trade have been uh, offered in the recent years. Now the interesting thing is that the frequency with which new theories rise um, in the recent years is increasing, which probably indicates that what we know today may actually be proven to be wrong tomorrow. So uh, I guess in defense of the theories, I would like to say that even though new theories are offered every pretty much year, it's not really that they invalidate the previous uh, research. In most cases, they refine the previous research. So if I had to summarize the whole field with all these theories, I'd say that the international trade is still, I don't want to say poorly understood, but there is a good chance we will know the field much better or we'll, we will have much better answers in a few years or maybe a few decades. Um, some of the knowledge is still fairly superficial and uh, the new theories will not invalidate what we know now, but will greatly refine um, and improve our understanding of what's going on. Right? So we're going to re uh, review some of these most uh, important theories so that you know uh, what may explain who trades with whom and most importantly what prescription we can give to national uh, leaders in terms of uh, international trade. Now, before we get into the theories, um, I would like to say one important thing. There is a quote from uh, Krugman, 1993, but he said it many times. Krugman is an economic um, the Nobel Prize winner in the field of economics. And so he's a very smart man. And uh, one thing that he said that struck me and that has been, um, in my opinion, proven many times that is kind of makes sense is that when we talk about international trade, and listen very carefully because this is probably the most important piece of information I'm going to give you in today's lecture. So when we talk about international trade, we should think of countries not as corporations but as people, again, in the international trade context, countries should be perceived or should be taken as people and not as corporations. There is a very different fundamental difference in uh, these two paradigms. When we talk about corporations, we normally assume that they have some kind of an external customer. And so for corporations, the game or interactions are pretty much a zero-sum game and a war. The more GM sells in terms of the number of cars, the more Chrysler loses. And so they compete with one another. What's good for GM is bad for Chrysler. What's bad, what's bad for Chrysler is good for GM or Toyota and GM. When we talk about people, it's completely different. People don't sell their services to somebody. They exchange services and goods. Let's say I'm a carpenter, I make chairs. You may be a painter, you paint houses. So we exchange. I make chairs for myself and for you. You paint your house and you paint my house. And we exchange services this way. So there is nobody that we compete for. We trade, we collaborate with you. So the trade between countries is very much like the exchange of services and goods between people. You rub my back, I rub your back. So mutually beneficial cooperation not competition. So one of the reasons many people um, take international trade, job outsourcing, uh, all that kind of stuff um, with some sort of hostility because again they often perceive their country to be a corporation that competes for some kind of external customer with for example China and that's not true. 
whatever we get from China, that's not because China is selling their stuff better to some kind of customer, it's because we need it. The reason China sells so much to us because when you come to a store and you see a product like this mouse, you like it and you choose to buy it. So that benefits us because we get a good product for a lower price. The same thing when we sell something to China, that's not because we force them to buy it or not because we um, screwed them up and got the customer. No, there is no customer. We are the customers, so we exchange goods. And so it's very important that you understand that paradigm because every time we say that China trades with the United States or what does the United States should sell, remember that that's almost like having Bobby and Billy and Sarah. And so the question is, what should they offer to one another to make each of the pot pe people or parties better off? So keep that in mind. Now, here is a real-life challenge that I would like to present you with before we discuss our first theory. And let's see if you will be able to come up with a good answer to this question. Imagine that there is a country, let's call it Exemplania, which is a comparatively rich country with an advanced technology, and it wants to gain most from its international trade. So, the king of Exemplania hires you and asks, whom should I trade with and what should I do to maximize the utility for my country? Now, Exemplania, as I said, is fairly rich and has some colonies and it's a fairly advanced country. So, you can think of, for example, like the United Kingdom in the times uh, when it was the empire. So, it has some poor neighbors, it has some rich neighbors in Europe. And so, the king hired you as a consultant uh, to help the king uh, make the decision as to, you know, who should trade with whom, uh, should uh, Exemplania increase or decrease its exports, increase or decrease its imports, and what should be imported or exported. What advice would you give to the country, uh, to the king? If you're watching this video, now is a very good time to pause for a few seconds and give it some thought. It's an in interesting exercise. So think as long as you want, pause the video, and hopefully now you're back after your pause and you have an answer. Now, I don't know what answer you personally gave me, but when I run this exercise in class, I get usually the, this type of answer. Increase exports, so sell more of your stuff overseas. Decrease imports. And when you're selling stuff, try to sell high-tech stuff and try to buy natural resources. Makes perfect sense, right? So sell as much as you can. Try to buy or limit imports as much as you can. So don't buy stuff. And uh, when you're selling things, try to sell finished goods. And uh, uh, when you're buying things, try to buy natural resources. Now, if this is the advice that you gave me, and there is a very good chance that's what you would recommend, I'd say this is a very bad advice, and this is the advice that could, be, could have been given based on the theories of international trade from about 15th century through 18th century. Nobody thinks that way. Well, most people still think that way, but no good economist would advise you to do that. We tried that for several centuries, and we know this is not the way to maximize your wealth. This is what we would call the mercantilism theory. And so at that time, that's exactly what the goal was. Maintain trade surplus. So sell as much as you can and limit imports as much as you can. When you sell stuff, try to sell good, expensive, uh, advanced products, buy natural resources, convert the trade surplus into gold, and basically collect wealth that way. Now, there are many flaws in this theory, and uh, they are not obvious. And so many people think, like, why? What was wrong with that? Uh, but there is a lot wrong with that theory. And so I would never advise something like that to a king if I were hired to do the job. Now, I recommend that you pause here for a few seconds and don't look at the inherent flaws listed here. Just pause for a second and think what's wrong with that kind of advice, why it's a bad advice. Now, I don't know what your concerns about the theory of uh, uh, international trade mercantilism theory was, but let me review the main concerns. One, and this is the biggest problem, is that it assumes a zero trade game. So it assumes that the more we screw up our neighbors, the better off we are. Because if we win, they lose, but if they win, we must lose. And this is not true. Uh, this is completely wrong. This is just not true. I'll give you a few examples of why this is wrong. First, let me go back to Krugman and talk about countries as neighbors, as people, as opposed to as corporations. Imagine that you live in a neighborhood with, um, uh, imagine that there are two neighborhoods in which you can settle down. In one neighborhood, everybody is rich and educated and professional. 
in this neighborhood everybody is either an excellent um, uh, programmer or an excellent carpenter or a painter or an artist or uh, a lawyer whatever that is so they're very good at what they do all highly professional people in another neighborhood every, everyone is pretty much homeless and you are you're a college graduate so you're a good um, highly educated person the question is in which neighborhood would you prefer to live or imagine that it's a whole country with people either highly educated highly sophisticated highly uh, professional versus a country of very poor people in which one would you like to live well obviously the answer is you probably want to live with the people or among the people who are very very talented advanced educated um, and professional why well not only because it's going to be safer for you that way and obviously it would be safer to you that way because poverty breeds crime and uh, problems but also because you can get more from those people uh, if you let's say are a business manager right so you probably want to get uh, and trade with people who can offer the most in exchange so you want to have a uh, good carpenter by your side to make good furniture for you you probably want to have a good um, um, artist um, by your side who can make produce beautiful paintings for you you probably want to have um, I don't know a great pro programmers around you so that they can make a great uh, website for you in exchange you can offer your managerial expertise or whatever you specialize in and so everybody benefits now if everybody is a beggar around you if everybody is a um, homeless person around you Yes, you would be much, much more skilled than anyone else. And so your uh, services would be in much, much higher demand than anybody else's. But uh, what can they offer you in exchange? That's one. And second, what can you charge for your services if nobody has money around you and uh, cannot afford your services? You'll probably end up selling your services for much less than you would have otherwise. And this is the case if you go to a developing country. The same expertise you would be paid $100,000 here in this country probably would be worth only $10,000 in the developing country just because nobody can afford to pay more. It's exactly the same thing with the countries. Even though it may look like it's better off to be a rich, uh, advanced country among poor neighbors so that whatever you have to offer, everybody wants. But if everybody else is poor, first, they will not be able to pay much for your services to you. But more importantly also, they will not have much to offer to you. So, and then on top of that, obviously, they will not be happy with you, so there will be all kinds of safety concerns for your country, uh, and that would be basically the same story of colony and colonizer. A couple more stories about this. Um, so, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, would it be better off if it was uh, surrounded by rich countries or by poor colonies? And again, it may sound like you can extract all those natural resources from nearly no money from the poor colonies, but again, uh, the United Kingdom, as we now know, benefits much, much more from exchange of services and goods with, for example, Germany than with Ghana. Ghana is a huge country, as big or probably even bigger than Germany. But again, it's much more profitable to buy Mercedes um, and BMWs and sell to them your Rolls Royce and uh, Jaguars than to trade with poor uh, Ghanaians uh, who can really offer you nothing except for maybe some natural resources that they have but even that I mean uh, you can probably get them for a fair price from Germany if Germany had it uh, and probably the price wouldn't be really that different than the price you would be paying for the uh, natural resources from the colony so that's one thing second uh, sometimes again uh, the countries can be so poor that they cannot even buy anything from you so for example in the 70s and 80s when the United States just started, uh, started developing relationships with China there were a couple of companies, uh, or some of the first companies that went in, into China, they were frantically looking for products and services that they can sell there. They saw over a billion people and they thought, well, that's, you know, that's a huge market. So what can we sell to them? Well, obviously we can sell to them something that is very cheap. People here are not rich, so it's got to be something very cheap so that they can you know, buy it from us. And so there was this one company that I read about uh, that after much market analysis, they came to a conclusion that the only thing that they can sell is kerosene lamps. Those are very cheap, like a dollar one uh, per unit. And they thought, well, all right, so this ch this stuff, people in China can buy because anything more sophisticated, they won't have money. And it was a failure. The reason was because they were too expensive for the people there at that time. People in China in the 70s and even in the 80s were so poor that even the simplest products were too expensive for them. And so you couldn't make really much money. So when you think about countries as people and you can think about uh, trade as exchange, not as competition for some kind of external customer, you realize that you're much better off when 
you, you know, you're a good back robber and he's a good back robber so that you can rob his back well and he can rob your back well in exchange because if the person is, um, I don't know, crippled or, you know, um, not capable of scratching your back well, you don't really get, gain anything in, in it from this exchange or at least not much. And so this is a very important thing to remember. Uh, another thing is that the, uh, mercantilism basically assumes a constant output and consumption. And again, this is not true. The pie is not only divided between the two countries, but can also expand. And the more you expand the pie, the better off everybody is because each party gets a bigger, larger piece of pie. And even though in terms of percentage of the pie, you may be still getting the same 50% or maybe even less than what you would have gotten if you were a big advanced metropolis and everybody else around you were colonies. But that smaller percentage may account for a much bigger volume. And so that's very important. Uh, to, to remember. Finally, again, uh, mercantilism usually leads or inevitably leads to the same conclusion that try to oppress your neighbors, try to make them colonies, and so this way you will be better off. But as I said many times already, um, the poorer are your neighbors, the more oppressed they are, the worse off they are. And again, if I may use this kind of sensitive example of trade between people, mercantilism largely assumes uh, basically slavery type of, uh, slavery type of relationships. Take as much as you can from people around you, make them work for you for nothing, and you will be better off. And this is completely wrong, not only because it's immoral to uh, exploit other people, but because it's economically not feasible. If you have somebody work for you as a slave, the person first will not be able to fully develop its potential, his his or her potential, right? So um, the person will not be able to be as productive as the person can be. And so even though, yes, everything the person makes you get, you get, you are the, uh, the owner of the person, for example, you get everything the person makes. But if you oppress the person, the person cannot really make much. On top of that, the person doesn't really have much interest to work for you. It's so much better when all people are fully uh, uh, maximizing their potential and offering one another everything that they can offer. So that kind of relationship definitely benefits people much, much more. So it's not in anybody's interest to have a class of people who are oppressed, forced to live in poverty, and forced to work for nearly no pay for somebody else. Because that makes those people very limited in what they can offer in exchange for uh, services and goods that they can buy from you. And so as a result, you all lose. I mean, that's, that's definitely, as I said, slavery is not only deeply immoral and uh, uh, just completely wrong from the ethical perspective, but also it doesn't make any economic sense just doesn't make any economic sense. It just doesn't work. It, it, it's not profitable even for the owners of the slaves. Much, much better to have a mutual partnership relationships. Now, here's another real-life exchange uh, example that I would like you to uh, look at and see if you have the answer for it. Assume that there are only two countries, and in this specific case, it would be Portugal and Finland, right? And assume that each country has a budget of $100 or is capable of producing goods worth of $100. Hopefully you're still following me. Uh, me. Now, Portugal can make excellent wine and the bottle of the wine will cost $1. Portugal can also make cell phones, but the cell phones will cost uh, $30 a piece. That's how much it will cost Portugal to make cell phones. Finland, on the other hand, has a much colder climate. Uh, grapes don't grow there so easily. So Finland can make uh, wine, but the wine will cost only about 30, I mean, will cost as much as $30 per bottle. But Finland is very good at making cell phones, and Finland can make cell phones at $1 a piece. So the question is, if you were uh, hired as a consultant with these two countries, what would, it, would you advise <coughs> to the uh, leaders of the countries in terms of international trade? In other words, what you would recommend that Finland sells and buys and what you recommend that Portugal sells and buys. And how many units of each product, again, in this two country, two product, limited budget type of situation. Again, this is a very good time to pause and give it some thought. Re-click on play uh, or click on play again in five minutes after you have given it some thought and we'll talk about it some more. So hopefully by now you have given it some thought and hopefully you have some suggestions. And I'm guessing that your suggestions are based on the absolute theory, advantage theory. Most likely what you're recommending at this time is that you would recommend that Portugal is making wine and wine only and sells the surplus uh, to Finland. 
and Finland instead makes cell phones and cell phones only and sells a surplus uh, of cell phones to Portugal. And if this is the advice you're given, you're absolutely right. That's pre precisely what absolute advantage theory suggests. Very common sense, very logical, and definitely uh, works uh, based on the data that we have. Uh, so to put it in simple terms, the answer would be focus on what you do the best and sell the surplus and buy everything else from other nations. The main idea or the, the original idea belongs to Adam Smith in his Wealth of the Nations. He uh, was talking about the example of France and the United Kingdom and um, about wine and wool. And so because the United Kingdom is much better at making wool, I mean the climate is just more suitable for sheep, and then France is much better at making wine, the climate is just more suitable for growing grapes. Uh, his advice was uh, rather than make both products in each country, uh, the United Kingdom will be much better off by making more wool and trading the surplus of wool uh, for wine from France. And France would be much better off if it focused on making uh, wine and then trading uh, wine for wool with the United Kingdom. Very simple. Now let's get into something more sophisticated. Here is a real life explanation uh, of. Uh, not really more sophisticated, just a real-life explanation of this more complicated story. And again, I'm going to give you one challenge uh, from the real life, and let's see if you will be able to come up with the answer. Again, this is fairly simple stuff, but let's go over it. Now, you probably know these two people. Now, this man obviously is Tiger Woods, right? The face of Nike. Uh, not anymore since those sexual scandals that he had, but um, Tiger Woods, the, the golfer. This man, anyone knows who this man is? You may be a little too young now to remember, but uh, four years ago when President Obama was running for um, uh, the post of the president, he got into an exchange uh, with um, Joe the Plumber. And so this is the guy, Joe the Plumber. And so he was quite popular uh, for a few days, um, had his 10 minutes of glory when he confronted president with some questions. Now, here is that real life challenge. Imagine that Tiger Woods wakes up one morning and finds that his toilet is not working. Clock. Uh, now Tiger Woods has a choice here. He can try to fix the toilet himself or he can hire uh, Joe the plumber to do the job for him. Now Tiger Woods makes $10,000 an hour advertising for Nike. But he is a lousy plumber. He's never fixed a toilet in his life and it will probably take him about 10 hours to fix that toilet. Joe the plumber makes $50 an hour and he can fix toilets like a charm. He can fix any toilet in four hours at most, and probably much less than that. Now, the thing is that, um, so now, also after um, becoming a celebrity following that exchange with the president, or at that time presidential uh, candidate, um, Joe the Plumber became a minor celebrity. And so Nike uh, has a new line of products called Everyday Max. And so they wanted to have somebody like an everyday guy uh, to advertise or to be the face of that uh, product line. And so they hired or offered uh, Joe the Plumber a job for $25 an hour. So the question is, should Tiger Woods hire Joe the Plumber to fix the toilet or should Joe, uh, uh, Tiger Woods uh, fix the toilet himself? And should Joe the Plumber fix the toilet for $40 an hour or should he uh, work for Nike for $25 an hour? What would be your advice? <clears throat> now, I'm guessing that your advice would be all the Tiger Woods, don't fix the toilet, hire somebody. The reason for that is the opportunity cost. Remember that word. You will have one exam question where opportunity cost will be the answer. So that's your opportunity. Hello? Now, you probably would also recommend that Joe the Plumber keeps fixing toilets because this job pays him much better than advertising. And yes, of course, you can say that maybe he should get into advertising and hope that eventually one day he will be getting more money. But again, assuming static conditions, assuming that nothing really changes, Joe the Plumber is better off at fixing toilets because this is something he does much better than Joe the Plumber can do. At the same time, Joe the Plumber uh, shouldn't be competing with Tiger Woods for advertisement for Nike because uh, Tiger Woods is a much better person for that kind of job. So uh, going back to your take-home assignment, let's think for a while, where does the United States hold absolute advantage? In other words, what are the products or services that the United States 
makes much much better than anybody else on this planet and so I'm going to give you a few hints. Uh, you can use some of them for the take-home assignments. You can probably come up with much better uh, ideas. For example, location. Yes, there are many planets, uh, there are places on this planet that are beautiful and interesting for tourists. But if you want to see New York, well, there is only one New York. If you want to see the Grand Canyon, there is only one Grand Canyon. And so America would be a perfect, wonderful destination for tourists interested in that kind of adventure or scenery. And obviously, the United States would be the main uh, destination uh, for tourism for Americans. It's close, it's beautiful. I mean, nobody can compete uh, for this customer base. Language, that's another interesting area. So uh, English is becoming, American English is becoming the world language. And the United States obviously is uniquely positioned uh, to offer training in this language. Nobody, no other country can offer uh, this type of service so well. So ESL education is definitely where the United States has the absolute advantage. Customer service, again, the United States has a history of strong customer service. Military, again, I mean, experienced personnel, the United States has been leading a number of wars for who knows how long now. And so its personnel is not only exceptionally well equipped with the latest technology, but also has the experience and has the expertise uh, to fight, as well as weapons. I mean, the United States is definitely uh, one of the most advanced weaponry makers, and uh, so uh, hardly any country can compete with the United States at making planes, guns, airplanes, and what I mean, uh, boats and whatever else needs to be made to make uh, uh, good weapons. All right, so now that we've covered most of the stuff related to the um, absolute um, and mercantilism theory, absolute advantage and mercantilism uh, trade theories, here is your bonus question for listening to this lecture. And the answer is? Now, here is your next life, a real life challenge. And this one is much more challenging than the previous one. Again, we have two countries. We have two products. We have wine and we have cell phones. We have Finland and we have Portugal, each capable of making $100 worth um, uh, of products. The thing is that in this challenge, let's assume that the global warming is underway and the climate in both countries has, has changed substantially. And now the price of making wine in uh, Portugal has uh, increased dramatically. So it's going to be $10 a gallon now, much, much more expensive because of the I don't know, droughts and uh, too hot a climate. It also has improved its technology, and it can now make cell phones uh, $20 a piece. Now, Finland's climate has warmed up, and Finland is now uh, growing its own grapes. And so, with the cost of growing grapes that Finland has now, Finland can make wine at $5 a gallon. Now, Finland can still make cell phones at a very good price, and so the cell phones still cost about a dollar a piece. Now, the question is, should Finland buy anything from Portugal? And if yes, what? Should Finland sell anything to Portugal? And yes, if and if yes, what? And then if uh, Portugal should buy or sell anything to or from uh, Finland. So look at this challenge here and give me your advice uh, in about a minute. So again, summing up. Finland does everything better than Portugal. Both makes cell phones much cheaper as well as wine much, much cheaper. The question is, can these two countries trade or does it make any economic sense for these two countries to trade? Well, I'm not sure what your answer is, but most people at this time say no, it doesn't make sense. Finland shouldn't trade with Portugal. Finland should make everything in its house because it just doesn't make sense to buy from Portugal uh, things that are more expensive there. Some students said that yes, Finland should trade. Finland should focus on making phones and sell phones to uh, Portugal and then buy uh, wine from Portugal. If that's what you're advising, then my question would be, are you saying that Finland should buy wine at $10 a gallon when it can make that same wine for $5 a gallon? I mean, are you saying that I should buy something much more expensively from you when I can myself make it much better and much cheaper? And if you say yes, you should, then yes, you are correct. It definitely makes sense. I have a hypothetical example here, and uh, obviously quantities can be different. Uh, and I encourage.
encourage you to look at these numbers, you will have something of this kind on the exam. But the main idea of this uh, table is that if you focus on making something that is much more profitable for you, then you will be better off in the long run. Long run. Yes, it may not make much sense for uh, Finland to buy wine more expensively in Portugal, but the thing is that uh, Finland can make so much more on cell phones that it would be a waste of resources, a loss of the opportunity if Finland was wasting its resources on making wine. Because you can make $19 on a piece of cell phone, right? And you can make only $5 on uh, a bottle of or a gallon of wine. So it just doesn't make sense for you to do it, even if you are much better at making bulk products. So when you look at these numbers, you will see that uh, by trading, by focusing on making what you what is most profitable for you and buying everything else, actually both countries would benefit uh, and both countries would be better off. And this is what we call comparative advantage. Let me give you a real life example, one that you can relate to, and uh, one that illustrates that even if you're not best at anything you still may be in a good position and somebody else may be willing and interested in trading with you. So imagine this situation again, you know these two people, so you know uh, Tiger Woods, and let's say this is also Joe the Plumber. So somebody pointed out that's actually the guy from the Fantastic Four, not Joe the Plumber. But imagine that this is Joe the Plumber who pump up some iron because now he has a job with Nike and uh, he makes $25 an hour, and so he just wanted to look better. So. Here is the story, again, completely made up, but let's imagine that it's a true story. Um, Jordan also works for Nike, or advertises for Nike, and Nike pays, pays him uh, $10,000 an hour. Joe the plumber, just like Tiger Woods in the previous example, wakes up on morning and finds that his toilet is clogged. Now, just like Tiger Woods in the previous example, uh, Jordan has um, a choice. He can fix the toilet himself, or he can hire somebody else, Joe the plumber, to fix the toilet for him. Now, Joe the plumber also makes $50 an hour as a plumber, but uh, now Nike offers him $40 an hour uh, for advertising. So the question is, should Jordan hire Joe the plumber, or should Joe the plumber seek job, seek employment with Jordan? Now, there is one very important caveat here. Again, completely made up, but let's assume that is, uh, that is true. Jordan was growing up, around an uncle who was a plumber and so Michael Jordan is so good at fixing toilets he can fix toilets better than he can shoot three-pointers so he can fix the toilet in one hour himself he can do it very very easily so he is much better at fixing toilets than uh, Joe the plumber is now at the same time Jordan is also much better than uh, uh, Joe the plumber um, at uh, advertising so the kind of challenge here or the little kind of trick here is that Joe the, uh, I mean Michael Jordan is best at everything here. He's better at advertising and he's also better at fixing toilets. The question is, should he be hiring Joe the plumber to do the job? Well, in this case, unlike the two country story, it is obvious that yes, he should. Yes, Jordan should hire somebody else to fix the toilet because it just would be a waste of his time to do it himself. What I normally say to that when a student says that, I say, well, so are you saying that you should hire someone to do a job for you when even when you can do that job better yourself? And obviously, the answer is yes. You shouldn't mow your own lawn just because you can do better uh, the job than you know those guys that come and do it for you because maybe you can make much more money as an accountant or as an artist or whatever else you do. And so this is what we call a comparative advantage theory. Even though Joe the Plumber, in this specific situation is not best at anything, he is still likely going to be hired by somebody else to do a job for those people because of the opportunity cost, right? So the same thing with countries. Even if there is a country out there that may not be best at anything, it would still be in a position to trade with its neighbors because its neighbors might be much more interested in focusing on other more profitable products and buying something from this country. Like for example, take Japan. Japan is very good at making electronics, at making computer chips, at making industrial robots. And it may be also the best at fishing, but for, uh, for Japan, wasting its resources on, for example, fishery is not really that profitable. And so in many cases, Japan actually buys the fish food from Thailand, from China, because it would be much more beneficial for Japan to spend its natural, I mean, its resources, its people's time on making things that are much more profitable than fishing, right? So this is the comparative advantage theory. And again, it sounds very complicated, but again, the prescription here is that 
focus on what you do best and buy everything else. So make only what you're best at and buy everything else. And that means that even if you're better at everything than everybody else, just make the product that is most profitable and buy other things. Even if those other things can be made cheaper internally, it's still better for you to use your manpower on making stuff that is more profitable. I hope this makes sense to you. Now, the big question becomes or is, are those theories not perfect? I mean, it seems like they explain fairly well who should trade with whom. They're definitely much better than mercantilism. So what's wrong with them? Why there is a need for better newer theories? Can you think of disadvantages or limitations of the comparative advantage theory and the absolute advantage theory? I'm going to pause here for a while and let you think. And we'll come back in a few minutes and uh, hopefully you will have some thoughts by that time. Don't wait for me to continue on with the lecture. Give it some thought. This is an interesting exercise. I mean, I, I truly encourage you to pause here and give it some thought. Five or maybe even ten minutes of thought. So what are the limitations and uh, disadvantages of the comparative advantage theory? Well, there are many. First, it assumes that the nations are trying to uh, maximize its production and consumption. But it's not always the case. It's not all about uh, consuming more and buying and selling more. Other things uh, that maybe political factors or maybe societal factors may play out uh, and play an important role. Like for example, often it may be a um, desire to reduce unemployment. And so uh, sometimes uh, products that may not make much economic sense would be in place just to keep people uh, employed. Second, and this is a big deal, the theory largely ignores the transportation cost. It just assumes that once I want to sell or buy something from or to a country, that's all I need to decide on. One other side, I just can, you know, move the products. In reality, the distance may mean lots of cost. I mean, a very high cost of transportation. And then all of a sudden, all the math just doesn't add up. Another very important thing is that um, it assumes 100% employment. Yes, opportunity cost is a big deal. Yes, opportunity cost um, is an important factor. Why would Finland want to make wine when it can make so much money on the phones? But the truth is that in many cases uh, there are unemployed people, and so if not everyone is employed making cell phones, perhaps it would be better uh, to have those people employed making wine if they're not capable of making phones than to buy uh, wine from Portugal because otherwise they would be just unemployed. So this important factor is largely ignored. Um, also it ignores things like, for example, economies of scale. So the more you produce a certain product, the cheaper one unit becomes. And so sometimes for a country, I mean, when you say, Portugal, it costs $20 to make a uh, gallon of wine. Well, it may cost $20 to make the first gallon of wine, but if you make 1 million gallons of wine, maybe the marginal cost of that last unit uh, will be much lower. Finally, and this is probably most importantly, these theories assume perfect, econo perfect economic conditions, meaning that uh, whoever wants to buy, buys, whoever wants to sell, sells. And it's not always the case. What if I want to buy your cell phones, but you don't want to sell them to me? Or if I want to sell to you my wine, what if you don't want to buy your wine for either political reasons or whatever other reasons? Um, it also assumes that there are no import tariffs and other barriers to trade. And in many cases, that's not the case. Maybe the parliament of uh, Portugal became more protectionist and decided to uh, raise import tariffs on uh, Finland's phones. And so, again, that makes it completely um, a different story in terms of, you know, if you should trade or not. Plus, obviously, uh, it ignores such things as, you know, like historic dominance, for example, or first mover advantage, or consumer brand preferences, uh, or whatever else. Maybe these days everybody wants to buy iPhones and not Nokia phones. And maybe even there is no difference between those uh, two brands, but people may like one and not like the other. And so economic uh, feasibility and economic um, Advantages purely based on price and value may not always be as important as uh, consumer perceptions and preferences. Now, here are a few more examples of uh, or explanations of um, uh, issues related to comparative advantage uh, theory. I'm going to skip them. You can read them in the slides when you have a minute. But these are some of the interesting, uh, more interesting examples related to the United States. And so, briefly. Uh, the truth is that, for example, the United States has one of the highest product failure rates in the entire world. So the truth is that the United States can actually make just about anything better than anyone else, including, for example, things that we buy from China. 
the reason we still buy so much stuff from China, like including t-shirts, for example, it's not because China can make them better, and not even necessarily can make them cheaper. The reason is because uh, there are not so many people in the United States available to make that stuff. Yes, there are many unemployed people at this time, that is true, but they're scattered around the country. And so if you wanted to, for example, open a factory here in the United States, I mean in Greensboro, you wouldn't find that many people available right away to work on that specific product. And so as a result, sometimes it's cheaper to buy it from China than to look for, uh, you know, to develop a capability to make this product internally. Second, if you have lots of money and, you know, enough to build a factory, chances are you will be much better off making, for example, I don't know, medical equipment uh, chips uh, than to make t-shirts. And so one of the reasons uh, t-shirts are not made in the United States is not because somebody is evil, either China or entrepreneurs that are not patriotic enough. No, it's because if you have $10 million enough to build a small factory, you will probably invest the money in something else, something that is more profitable than, than t-shirts. And so the reason China makes them is because it just doesn't make much sense to make them in the United States. People here are much more qualified, are much more educated, and they are capable of making things that are much more profitable. So uh, things are happening not because of the you know, world conspiracy or somebody not being a good person. In most cases, it's because there are incentives to do it this way and not another way. And so the reason nobody makes uh, t-shirts anymore in the United States is not because they're bad, just because they can make more money for the United States and offer better jobs for Americans than making t-shirts. Now here is your next bonus question. I like to include this question in exams even though it will not appear in the same form, but questions of this ty type uh, are likely to appear in the exams. So try to kind of understand what's going on here. The numbers will be different, so no need to photograph this question and, uh, you know, commit it to memory. It's better to understand what's going on here so that when you see a situation like this again, you will know better how to answer it. And the answer to this question, obviously, is C, focus on domestic production on microchips and buying rice from China. The reason for that is, even though Korea can make both products better, but it would be more profitable for Korea, at least based on the comparative advantage theory, to uh, make a more profitable product and uh, sell it for a less profitable product. <laughs> now, there are other theories of trade, and uh, so in many cases, they kind of you know, echo what has been said in the comparative advantage and uh, uh, com um, absolute advantage theories. And so I'm going to briefly, quickly go through them. It's important that you know the basics of each of them, but um, no need to get into much detail. Like for example, one of the theories called factor proportions theory. This one looks at what they call factors. So factors are the things that you need to make uh, products or services. Uh, basically, those are your natural resources, your human capital, all those kinds of things. So the main idea is that if you have lots of uh, human factors, uh, so if you have highly skilled uh, labor force, you should focus on products uh, that are very labor intensive or, or human capital intensive. So high tech stuff that requires lots of education. If on the other hand you have let's say lots of land or lots of natural resources, um, then you should be making products that require that kind of factor or resource. So if you have lots of oil, focus on making oil or producing oil. If you have lots of dollars, for example, focus on products uh, that are highly capital intensive, products that require lots of money to make but not necessarily lots of human capital. Um, can you think of other examples? And uh, the question that I normally ask at this time, stage is, just to illustrate how it works, um, the United States obviously has lots of money, right? It's one of the probably the richest nation. And so for the United States, based on this, this theory, it makes sense to uh, focus on production of products that are very capital intensive, products that require lots of money to make because other countries don't have uh, much advantage in this area. They don't, just don't have enough money to make that kind of investment. Now, the question I would like to ask you is, can you think of products that are extremely capital intensive and at the same time very low intensity, uh, uh, labor intensity? So products that are made almost absolutely perfectly by machines, meaning that you don't really need many people to manage production of that product, and at the same time, you need to invest lots of money into the machines that make the product. So what would be those products where literally a person comes early in, in the morning to work, 
presses a button on the machine to make it completely. And then uh, presses another button at the end of the shift and the machine stopped. I'll give you a hint. This product in, is in this very office, or there are actually two products that I can think of that are in this very office. Both are made in the United States. Obviously, why would you want to outsource that somewhere else when labor is a very, very small portion of the uh, you know, total production cost? And uh, can you think of those products? When I ask this question, students normally uh, think of you know computers or iPhones or you know some kind of high-tech equipment. And this is completely wrong. I mean, iPhones made in China, and you know iPhones are made in China, right? At Foxconn. They are made in China because, uh, well, because it's highly labor-intensive product and then assembling that thing. And so it is cheaper and more um, cost-efficient to make it in China. The same thing with computers. Probably the device in which you're now watching this video is made in China, was, was made in China. So that's not the correct answer. The correct answer is, uh, well, and there are many products, obviously, these are just two examples. But the two examples I'm thinking about are carpets and socks. So carpets are made predominantly in the United States, and it's a highly automated process. So once you have all the components in place, everything else is made by machines. Obviously, people don't weave um, uh, carpets anymore. The same applies to uh, socks. As long as you have the string, the cotton string or whatever you use to make your socks in place, press the button and the machine makes the sock and packages it and everything else. So uh, like unlike shoes that are still sewn by hand, socks are not. And so most of the socks that you buy in the United States would be made in the United States. Sometimes not because again, sometimes cotton would not be in the United States and so it makes sense to make the products there. But in many, many cases, unlike other products, uh, socks are highly automated and uh, <clears throat> or production of socks is highly automated. And so unlike shorts or pants or shoes, that need to be made by a human, um, socks are not. And so much of the uh, socks production is actually still in the United States. And then carpets, as I said, exactly the same story. Now, limitations of factor proportions theory. Even though it makes perfect sense, it doesn't always work. And there is what we call Leontief paradox. Technically, if that was true, then the United States would make only capital-intensive products, and China would make only labor-intensive products. But the statistics, international trade statistics, show that it's not always the case. The United States actually still makes lots of labor-intensive products, which is almost economically wrong. And then China tries to make more and more uh, sophisticated capital-intensive products. Now, another thing is that it doesn't account for um, regional differences. Yes, it is true that the United States in general has expensive labor, but lots of capital. But again, it's not always the same. I mean, Idaho definitely has much less um, uh, educated labor than, for example, California does. Uh, then also some of the factors may be much cheaper in different states. Like land is cheap in Arizona, but expensive in uh, Manhattan. And so all those things should be taken into account. And even human capital. I mean. Uh, some people are highly skilled, but others may not necessarily be highly skilled. Uh, some parts of job uh, within the same uh, production process may be highly skilled or not. I mean, a computer guy may be who writes the code for that computer on the uh, factory floor may need to be very educated, but the guy who cleans that equipment does not necessarily have to be. And obviously, productivity too. I mean, like 10 man hours in China are much less than 10 man hours in the United States because Americans tend to be more educated. And so just the sheer number of people uh, does not necessarily translate into a specific uh, comparative uh, figure. Here is your next question. Let's see if you can answer this question. And I gave you a hint to this question's answer uh, much earlier. So I did say that focus on this specific term. Let's see if you remember it. All right, three, two, one, and the answer obviously is. <clears throat> now, uh, there are a few more theories that I would like to mention. One of them is internal product life cycle theory. Uh, I'll use a specific product as an example, um, and so this product would be a computer. And so the theory says uh, that the life cycle of the product may determine who makes what and when. So, for example, in the 80s, a computer was a new product, and only the United States really could make computers. At that time, the United States would be making all of its computers and then selling them around the world. 
but then as over time computer has become a more standardized product and everyone can make one now which is about any country it didn't make sense for the United States anymore to keep making that product because China can make it equally well or maybe even better and so starting from the 90s and even more so in the 2000s the United States was primarily buying computers and not selling them anymore just because it became a standardized easy to make product and so now the United States focuses on something that others cannot replicate and so if you look at the graphs um, it would look like this so in the 80s for the United States making more computers selling the surplus but then over time as the computer becomes standardized product the United States actually buys more than it sells for other countries like second mover uh, movers like Japan so first Japan was buying more computers than uh, than making but then over time it learned how to make them and was actually making more and selling some uh, than it was in the 80s and then less developed countries like for example in this case China China was importing computers for much of the past decades but now it's finally catching up and learning how to make them and so starting a few years ago China actually makes more computers than it actually needs and uh, in fact most of the computers are now made in China because the first mover and the second mover don't want to make them anymore they want to focus on something more sophisticated now limitations of the internal production lab theory um, is that uh, it sometimes kind of again oversimplifies things first it works best for manufacturing products and particularly for products that are not so easy to make so computers obviously other electronic uh, equipment maybe cars but it doesn't work very well for such products like for example luxury items uh, for example um, arm watches um, even though my um, Iron Man watch is much better one than just about anything you can buy from Switzerland it has an internal computer it works with my computer uh, like PC it has a USB link and can you know download just about anything you have, just about anything your cell phone does it costs only $150 and made probably in China but then at the same time uh, nobody who makes luxury um, watches would be making them in China because the country of origin matters so people who buy a $10,000 uh, arm watch or maybe $50,000 arm watch to them it matters that it's made in Switzerland so even though economic feasibility or um, technology may say that you should be making those products where they can be made best and cheapest uh, the customer preference is such that the product may be forever made in for example Switzerland and so there are other types of um, restrictions of that kind like for example um, for example things like uh, hardly any product anymore is made by a specific country I mean most of the components are made internationally and even the computers that are made in China are not really made in China right they are assembled in China parts come from all around the world and so the, this theory, this particular uh, uh, product life cycle theory, it almost assumes this simplistic worldview where a product is made in a country and somebody replicates it, and so it doesn't kind of work very well in the globalized world. Now, here is your next question, and let's see if you can answer this one. And obviously, the, the answer is the comparative advantage. Now the final theory that takes it all into account or almost synthesizes um, all those previous theories, and not quite that way, but you know, a more comprehensive, comprehensive one. That's what we call the national competitive advantage theory, uh, presented by Michael Corder, a guy um, at, um, at the Harvard Business School, and so he talks about four different um, clusters or factors that should be taken into account. And so these would be factor conditions, firm strategy demand conditions and related and supporting industries and I'm going to go over each of them one by one to illustrate what he's talking about so when he talks about factor conditions those would be your basic factors like geography climate natural resources you know labor force as well as advanced factors like for example um, um, education system in place or network of professional schools or community colleges or that kind of stuff and so I'm going to use an example of the tile industry in Italy and so um, I'm not sure if you know, but Italy is number one manufacturer of tile. So the best uh, tile comes from Italy, and uh, it's the highest quality, highest price. And Italy, even though it's a comparatively small country, makes probably, I don't know, probably over half of uh, world's uh, tile production. 
one of the reasons for that is because they have the petra conditions there. So first of all, it's the right geography. So they have that natural resource, that uh, limestone or whatever they use to make tile, glue, or I mean clay. Uh, they have lots of it. So for them, obviously, it's an advantage. Second, they have the advanced factories. Uh, when um, Italy was completely destroyed in the Second World War, following the uh, war, they were trying to develop an industry to rebuild the country. So they needed lots of building materials. And so they developed a sophisticated network of community colleges and apprenticeship programs. And so including for a uh, tire tile industry. And so they have all that system in place. And so Italy trains more tile makers. I'm not sure what the name to that profession than any other country. And so they've kind of perpetuated that uh, advantage. And so even though now they don't have to rebuild the country anymore, but they still make tiles using those same resources, basic factories and advanced factories. Uh, it is important to remember, however, that the basic factory conditions uh, change over time. Just because, for example, uh, Italy has today the clay needed to make tile doesn't mean that it will be there forever. And there is a good chance Italy will one day run out of that resource and maybe another country will discover huge deposits of clay or limestone or whatever else they use for tile. tile. Even the change in climate may be a factor here. Uh, remember that example about wine we talked? Uh, well, it turns out that, for example, authentic Burgundy wine that has been historically made in Burgundy of France now can actually be made better in Scotland. Because it turns out that the climate now has changed substantially. And so what was 100 years ago, the climate of France, you can actually find it in uh, Scotland. And so France is now much hotter and much drier, whereas Bergen, I mean, uh, Scotland is now, uh, uh, or parts of the United Kingdom are now exactly what France used to be 100 years ago. So the best Burgundy wine these days actually comes from the United States and not from France. And so who knows what's going to be the... Uh, change over the next 100 years, uh, but it seems like now we've experienced changes in something that we normally don't think as something that changes. So even within the human lifetime, we can see those changes. Now, this one is very interesting, so I recommend that you listen carefully. This is demand conditions. According to Michael Porter, a country will have an advantage and will be better than other countries at something for what it has a strong internal demand. So before you can become good at something, you would have to kind of start small and then scale up. And so to start small, you would need to have that internal demand for that product. And so I'll use, for example, uh, software as an example. Um, the United States is definitely number one software producer in the world. Americans write many more um, like Microsoft, Apple with its own software. I mean, from games to operating systems, the United States is an unrivaled uh, producer of, of, of computer programs. Uh, one of the reasons for that, and uh, according to Porter's model, probably the biggest reason is that um, the United States has very strong internal demand for those kinds of products. For example, in China or in Russia, I'm sure there are many programmers who are equally qualified and can write code, uh, computer code or program code um, equally well uh, as their American counterparts can do. But um, in those countries, China and Russia, there is not much demand for that product, at least not at that price. People there are terribly poor, and uh, hardly anyone can pay four or $500 for an operating system. Here in the United States, people can and do. And so there is much demand for video games, for uh, just about anything you can buy on uh, CDs or on USB drives. Uh, that creates strong internal demand, and so that creates a whole internal industry. And so the United States um, obviously uh, is in, in a much better position. So in other words, if you want to write a computer code, you have to be in the United States. Because if you're in Russia, I mean, once you sell the first copy, somebody will pirate it and sell for much less. And so the United States here has a very big advantage. And not, not surprisingly, the United States is number one producer of uh, software. Uh, the same thing applied to Italy. It had a very strong internal demand uh, in the first years Following the World War, many houses had to be rebuilt. And so as a result, uh, it had the capability and internal demand to grow the whole industry. And once that whole internal industry was growing, it was so much better than anyone else uh, had that it could just go and scale up and uh, compete on the global arena and be very successful. Now, another important factor, according to Michael Porter, is the um, existence of supporting industries. As you understand, uh, just pretty much no product is made by a single factory. 
you need components from different industries, uh, you need um, support of different industries, and that sometimes plays a more important role than anything else. Uh, so hardly any product is made in isolation, like for example talking about um, Italian ceramic tile, uh, you understand that you would need somebody who would make um, the, uh, what is it called, um, animal, the thing that is put on the tile, the paint, uh, logistics might be very well developed if you want to sell the product over um, around the world. Uh, you probably would even need some form of um, computer support or IT support, so all that is very important. And unless you have all those support industries in place, uh, there is uh, you will have a very hard time competing with uh, other countries. Um, talking about the United States, the United States has a number of what we call production clusters, clusters that have whole you know network of supporting industries in one place. Uh, obviously you would think of uh, places like the Silicon Valley where you have uh, just about anything and everything related to the information technologies from computer design, electronic engineering to actually software development. And so if you want to make computers this is where you want to be because you know you need some kind of advice, you need some kind of product, you need some form of you know support. All you need to do is cross the street there will be probably a company there making what's needed for computers. The same thing if you go to Detroit, uh, there will be a whole network of industries there related to car manufacturing, from design to marketing to actual manufacturing to part supplies to logistics, all everything would be there. In the uh, North Carolina here, well obviously household furniture, uh, synthetic fiber, so textile before that, before it was tobacco industries. So the whole thing is in place. And so there are many clusters like that in the United States. and. Uh, um, because of that, the United States may be very good at making those specific products uh, and selling them around the world. Uh, now, talking about the support or importance of um, um, support industries, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, one would be, can you name the country that is the biggest exporter of diamonds? So a country that makes the most on diamonds in terms of the dollars or value of diamonds sold in terms of dollars. Can you name that country? Most people would say um, Russia or Canada or someplace in Africa because this is where the natural resources are. That's where the unpolished diamonds are. But the answer is it's Israel. Israel doesn't have any diamonds of its own but Israel has the whole network of industries in place needed to polish and sell and store diamonds. So from, uh, as I said, the logistics to polishing to selling to marketing to uh, um, uh, storing them in some kind of vaults. So Israel excels at that specific uh, thing. So because of um, the support industries, uh, Israel actually ends up making much more on diamonds than, for example, as I said, Canada or Russia, who actually have the diamonds. The same interesting funny example almost is that, um, do you know where or what country sells most of the products sold in China. In other words, when you walk into a Chinese superstore and you see all those products on the shelves, do you know the country of origin of the company that placed those products on the shelves in China? Not necessarily where they were made, but what was the company responsible for this final stage of actually delivering that product and putting it on the shelves? Not necessarily physically, but who was the last owner of the product before it appeared on the shelves? The answer is Hong Kong. Most of the products in China are actually coming in China through Hong Kong. In most cases, the products would be made in China, but it would be a Hong Kong company that placed the order to make them and then eventually sold them to a Chinese supermarket. Hong Kong, again, over time, developed this wonderful opportunity or capability of uh, being in logistics being a small tiny nation, uh, basically a port that has been moving products between Europe and uh, Asia for uh, who knows how long. They've developed this wonderful capability and they are excellent at moving stuff, um, being the middleman, as well as at advertisement, logistics and all everything related to those types of things. And so what really happens in most cases is that uh, all those products made in China, including those by the way that are sold in the United States, somebody comes up with the idea to make the product can be the original manufacturer of the product who now wants to outsource it, can be just an entrepreneur who wants to you know, make money on something, or those can even be the um, um, supermarkets in China that want to sell a specific product. 
In most cases, they don't go to a specific manufacturer in China. They come to a guy in Hong Kong and say, well, this is what we need and this is how much we need it. And then the middleman in Hong Kong would place the orders uh, uh, in China. And so the factory would make the products on paper or sometimes even physically. The products will be delivered to Hong Kong. And then the middleman in Hong Kong would send them to the retailers, either in China or another country. And so the funny thing is that even though just about everything made in China, I mean, sold in China is made in China, but in the process of kind of, you know, as the product was going from one company to another, from manufacturer to uh, distributor to retailer, uh, the distributor often is actually in Hong Kong. So even though Hong Kong doesn't make the products, the network of supporting industries plays an important role and Hong Kong makes billions and billions of dollars on Chinese made products sold in China, world figure. Um, Hong Kong and Taiwan, by the way, sorry. So. Now, firm strategy plays an important role. When we say China makes something, or when we say America makes something, like America makes iPhones, not really true, it's not really true. Who makes iPhones? Apple makes iPhones. And so it is very important for the country to foster those specific innovative leading companies. And so um, I'm not sure how much credit can America claim for making iPhones, but America can claim much credit for existence of Apple. And so Apple makes the phones. And so America cannot really make phones. America can create companies that make iPhones. So that economic environment that fosters innovation, um, safety provided to the company in terms of you know not being afraid that tomorrow your, your um, assets will be nationalized, uh, supplying highly educated people uh, that will be able to work in companies of that kind. All that makes uh, an important uh, plays an important role, but uh, in order to have those innovative companies, you have to have people like Bill Gates and uh, Steve Wozniak and uh, whoever else is um, contributing to the success of Apple. So, and that's very important. So, uh, America is only as strong as uh, all those Apples and Microsofts and GMs taken together. And so, this is very important that the company, I mean, that the country creates the environment that fosters. Um, um, companies like this. Now, here is a question. Can you predict uh, where the United States will excel in the next several decades? My prediction at, as a few years ago was uh, in electrical vehicles. Is that true or not? I don't know. Uh, this time it actually looks like the United States is losing to China. But here is why I think the United States will eventually be number one producer of electric vehicles. Factory conditions are here. It's extremely expensive to make an electric vehicle at this time and the United States has the money. It is extremely expensive to buy an electric vehicle today and the United States has the internal demand. China may be good at making vehicles, but it doesn't have many people in China who are willing and able to buy those more expensive vehicles. The United States does. Lots of people there driving all those Priuses and Jeeps and uh, so that's an important thing. Um, the United States also has all the support industries. I mean, an electric vehicle needs lots of support from the Silicon Valley type of support all the way to uh, the actual natural resources, to uh, ability to make cars, to ability to market cars, and the United States is very good at that. Now, in addition, the United States has a number of companies that are very good at this stuff. So, for example, Tesla obviously is doing very well, and so soon this year they will be selling um, the um, what is it called, the Concept S, the sedan. Uh, so now they only make the roadster, the sports car, but they will have a five-seater by the end of the year. Then obviously Nissan Leaf makes its cars in the United States, even though it's a Japanese company. And then there are a number of other companies that make electric cars in the United States, including, by the way, Chevy Volt of GM, and then obviously Ford and Chrysler experimenting with their technologies. But then there are a number of startup, uh, startups that make uh, vehicles for like corporate fleets and uh, you know for city vehicles, and then buses, electric buses, and all that stuff. And then obviously there is also government support, and that's a big deal. Uh, though, again, at this time, it's nothing compared to how much support um, the German uh, Chinese governments have given into this kind of uh, to this kind of industry. But there is some, and hopefully there will be more in the future. And if everything holds as it is, I'm predicting that soon enough, the United States will be number one in uh, making uh, electrical vehicles. Can you think of more examples? All right, so let me give you a couple more questions uh, for your patients to be here with me. So, can you answer this question? And obviously the answer is... Now, can you answer this question? 
and I'll move the answer is product development space is not one of them. Now finally, let me cover a couple of moments that are not covered in the textbook, but that I felt. So when we're predicting or trying to give advice for what the country should focus on in terms of international trade in the future, obviously we should be using economic theories. Uh, they explain and predict what's going to be most profitable for us. But if we are trying to explain what's going on now today, often we have to go far beyond uh, the economic explanations of the situation that we see today. And so let me give you a few examples of how non-economic factors often may shape who trades with whom. So let me give you a few things. One thing that we often forget is that <clears throat> in the global world today, talking about country of origin is um, almost an impossible task. I mean, today just about anything is made not in a single country, but all around the world. Take, for example, this memory uh, hard drive. I mean, I'm sure the wire was made in one country, probably the paint for it was made in another country, maybe the case was made in the third country, and so on and so on. And so just simply saying that it's a Chinese or an American-made product, that just doesn't make much sense. Um, a friend of mine recently had a CD player um, breakdown in his uh, car, and he has a uh, Hyundai Sonata. And so um, being a professor of economics, he wanted to trace the origin of that component. It turns out that it's designed in the United States and Japan, assembled in Taiwan, shipped to Mexico for installation in the car that is made in Mexico, but the car obviously is a Korean car. So there are a number of countries um, uh, playing a role there, and so I'm sure even individual components of that CD player are made in different countries, wire, electrical motor, whatever else goes there, the laser, the, the um, the disks, so all those components may be coming from different countries, and so when it says made in China, not necessarily a complete story there. Second, when we say made in, it doesn't necessarily tell us much. For example, if I were to ask you, which of these two cars is more American? So we have here um, Ford Mustang, and we have a Toyota Camry. So which of these two is more American? Toyota Camry or Ford Mustang? Well, obviously Ford Mustang is a is an icon of, uh, of America, so obviously it is as American as it gets. But if you now analyze it from the economic point of view, not the psychological kind of you know, uh, point of view, and if you, for example, count what percentage of the car was actually made in the United States, then Toyota Camry is a much more American car than Ford Mustang. Again, as you understand, uh, as understand Toyota and uh, Ford, they don't really make their cars per se. They make some components and then assemble the car. They may design the car too, but not make every single part. M windshields, um, tires, uh, electrical motors, paint, uh, just about any component or most of the components are usually made by other companies. So the actual manufacturer may be designing the engine, may be designing some other parts, maybe even making some parts, but really not that much. And so there is more American-made parts in Toyota Camry than there are in, Ford, uh, in a Ford Mustang. And so if you look at specific economic kind of background, then Toyota Camry is more American than Ford Mustang is. Other things may be just historic um, leftovers. Uh, this animal here is a um, is an angora goat. Um, it grows, or the suitable climate for this animal is um, in New Zealand, in Australia, in some parts of Europe. Not that much in the United States. Well, following the First World War, the United States was preparing for um, another world war just in case, and so the prediction was that there may be um, an offensive from the north. Uh, either Europeans will come there, Russians or somebody may be attacking from there. And so the U.S. Army felt that it would be important to develop uh, or design uniforms that would keep American soldiers warm. And so Angora goat has an unusually long hair. And so that long hair is used to make what we call mohair. So that's a very type of uh, warm type of uh, fabric. And so the U.S. government... Uh, eventually decided, uh, or at some time decided, to subsidize um, 
farmers who grow angora goats so that they can make this uh, warm uh, military clothing. Uh, for many years, that's what was used to make uh, military uh, apparel. But then, as the synthetic uh, substitutes for this product were developed, uh, it became just evident that this is not the best product to make uh, warm uniforms. And so, starting from 1982, I mean, starting from 1946, the U.S. military was not using uh, more hair to make uh, warm sweaters for its soldiers. Uh, the, uh, the military was using something else. But because so many farmers were subsidized uh, by the U.S. government to make that product, as you understand, stopping subsidies would mean that many people would be left without uh, uh, jobs. And so that would be at that time a political decision. And so even though the U.S. military stopped using uh, uh, more hair in 1946, the subsidies continued up until 1982. And since there was not much demand for that product in the United States, the farmers would be selling most of it uh, overseas. And so the United States, up until a few years ago, actually, was number one producer of mohair uh, or grower of mohair uh, of angora goats and then uh, subsequently of mohair products, even though it was not the best climate, even though it was not economically feasible, just because of those political leftovers. So winners in this came, uh, case were obviously farmers. Losers were taxpayers who effectively paid farmers to make a product that should have not been made here in the first place, at least not after 1946. Another almost funny example goes to the uh, Duluth Superior Bridge. This bridge connects two states, Minnesota and Wisconsin, and it was built uh, using money from a federal grant. Now, the interesting thing about this bridge is that uh, when the two states applied and received the federal grant to build the state, I mean the bridge, uh, they had to make a, a very important decision. They had to decide uh, where they would get the steel to build the bridge. I was crossing that bridge with a friend of mine a long time ago, and he was an economics professor. And as we were approaching that bridge, he said, listen carefully and tell me what you hear. So we were driving on that bridge, going from uh, Wisconsin into Minnesota. So I don't really hear anything. He says, listen, listen. And so uh, what happened then, I'll tell you uh, in a few seconds. But uh, let me go back to the original story. So the reason they had a problem answering that question, where the steel must come from, is because there are many steel mills in uh, Minnesota. So Minnesota has lots of its own steel. Wisconsin doesn't. Wisconsin doesn't make steel. So when the question, when it came down to where are we going to buy the steel, uh, Wisconsin obviously said, well, let's shop for the best price. And uh, Minnesota obviously said, no, 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 we're going to use Minnesota steel. I mean, don't we want to support local producers? I mean, it wouldn't make sense to go anywhere else. And so Wisconsin still went ahead with the um, shopping. And eventually they figured uh, that the steel from uh, Japan would be much cheaper and at the same time would be of much higher quality. And since uh, Wisconsin officials don't care about job creation in Minnesota, they figured, well, we'll go with the best deal. We just want to get the best deal for the best money. Uh, but for Minnesota, obviously, it's a political question. I mean, if you're a governor of Minnesota, you would never authorize purchase of the steel from overseas, from Japan, uh, because you know you will lose votes of the local steelmakers. And so after going back and forth, back and forth, they eventually reached a decision. But before I tell you what their decision was, uh, I want to ask you, what would you do? Would you go with the best product or would you go with the economic, I mean politically feasible choice? Um, that probably also relates, I mean you make those choices all the time. When you, for example, buy, bought your uh, car, what car do you drive? Well, if you drive a Japanese car, for example, well, maybe that was not patriotic of you. Maybe you should have done something else. On the other hand, if uh, the best option for you in terms of quality and value is uh, something that is made outside the country, the question is, should you sacrifice and how much in order to keep uh, jobs in your country? Well, anyway, we'll get to those questions um, uh, in the next lecture because we'll be talking about job outsourcing and its economic effects, but for now, Let's get back to that bridge. And so we're driving on that bridge, and roughly around the middle of the bridge, once we had that point, I start hear hearing this rattling sound, like literally a rattling metal sound, like, you know, cleaning and all that stuff. And so what happened, uh, and the reason I heard that sound was that uh, after going back and forth, the commission, uh, the bi-state commission, uh, couldn't reach an, a compromise. And so what they did was they built the Minnesota side of the bridge using Minnesota steel and uh, the Wisconsin part of the bridge using Japanese steel.
and then because Japanese steel, at least at that time, was of better quality, the Wisconsin part of the bridge still holds and works very well, whereas the Minnesota part of the bridge started rusting, uh, became rusty and became not as coherent anymore. So when you drive on that side, you actually can hear the, um, the rattling sound. And then, so as you can see here, the decision is not only purely economic. I mean, there are other factors at play, and sometimes those factors may lead to decisions that seem almost finance in this case. Now, another, and this is very important, and I'll talk more about it in the next lecture, but um, when we talk about decisions about who buys and who sells what, in most cases, it's not really an economic choice. In many cases, that's the result of the impact of the interest groups. I'll tell you a story, and you'll understand what I mean. Uh, in the 80s, when Japan was emerging as the number one player in the steel market, the United States was losing uh, jobs in the steel industry daily. Uh, the reason they call that region in the Midwest the Rust Belt is because there used to be lots of steel-related production going on there, and there is not anymore, and so it kind of became rusty, so not much going on there anymore. Now. When that was happening in the 80s primarily, American steel makers felt that they needed protection because see the Japanese are coming and taking our jobs. And so the United Steel Workers uh, is one of the biggest and most successful um, labor unions uh, that represents steel workers in the United States. And they were very successful at lobbying a law that would impose a huge import tariff on Japanese steel in an attempt to protect, protect American jobs. So they were successful at lobbying, lobbying that bill, and so it was before the Congress and uh, awaiting a vote uh, that would be happening sometime soon. Everything sounds very nice in theory, right? So Americans are losing jobs to Japanese, so let's impose import tariffs on Japanese steel to protect American jobs. Sounds very patriotic and sounds very um, economically reasonable. Well, the bill was never passed, and you know why? Because once it became a possibility that the bill may be passed, another very powerful labor union intervened, and that's the United Auto Workers. Turns out that the auto workers actually benefit a lot from the cheap steel. And by being able to buy cheap Japanese steel, they can make better and cheaper cars. Now, if the original bill was passed, that would mean that the jobs in the United Steel uh, or in the steel industry would be preserved. But that would also mean that the auto workers would have a harder time selling their products both in the United States because they're more expensive as well as competing internationally because they no longer would be buying Japanese steel. And so that would mean that the jobs in auto industry would be lost. And so by kind of basically protecting one interest group, you almost always hurt somebody else. And in this case, another interest group, which is uh, automakers as well as customers. And so it's not so simple as it looks. I mean, every time somebody says, let's protect American jobs, what the person really says is, let's charge more for that product um, of the uh, American customers, as well as, again, there is a very good chance that means let's hurt some other industry so that my voters could get their stuff and uh, I would be reelected. So just keep that in mind. Um, so special interest groups, as I said, are often key players in the decisions, economic decisions at the macro level. But again, it got to be taken into account at a more sophisticated level because again, by protecting one group, you're not necessarily keeping everyone else in the same situation. You're often hurting other groups. And usually it's at least the customers and in many cases, some other uh, industries. Now, here's your last question for today. Three, two, one, and the answer is non-economic factors in international trade. This is what you need to know on the exam, and as always, I guarantee you there will be nothing on the exam that is not covered on this list. Um, thank you very much, and uh, I'll see you in the next video lecture.